So I, I want to welcome you to our webinar today, which is biomass boiler retrofits three school case studies. We'll be looking at at uh, a couple of high schools and, an, and a uh, middle school uh, that we renovated uh, with brand new biomass boilers. And in all cases, they're uh, using our dry chips and uh, should make for an interesting conversation here. We've got Mark Froling, the president of Froling Energy, and Mike Davey, who's project manager for Energy Efficient Investments. Uh, both uh, were actively involved on these jobs. Uh, Mike was not involved in the in the elementary school or the middle school, uh, but the two high schools. And uh, and he'll they both have a lot uh, a lot to say about these projects, how they evolved, and, and what happened. I thank you. I'm going to turn this over to Mark Froling now. And Mark, you'll want to share your screen and uh, get started. So uh, thank you very much for attending. Hello, everyone. This is Mark Froling from Froling Energy. I'm uh, the owner and, and managing partner here. And um, we run, let me just, I, I uh, just have to get the screen to full size. Come on. There we are. So we run a biomass boiler company or biomass energy company. And um, we install and maintain and sell fuel for anything biomass related. And um, that entails a few different uh, types of fuels. And related to that, of course, we, inst you know, we install the boilers, but we also um, maintain things and we of course, our mechanical contractors. So we also provide the mechanical services to pipe up a school, to install distribution systems alongside the front movers here, and also to um, maintain various parts of the HVAC system altogether. Uh, our scope is um, quite varied from project to project, but um, we're oftentimes involved in the project development through the sales cycle and um, uh, also do a little bit of the design work. But of course, in most cases, we work with mechanical engineers. We then provide the project management and have site supervisors as well as project managers. And then we go into the full construction through procurement and um, all the way through into uh, commissioning. And then afterwards, we have a maintenance and service division that maintains these borders for the years to come. And, um, and in some cases, we provide the fuel alongside of that with just dry chests. Today, we'll talk about, oops, um, just three, three uh, school uh, projects in general, but we're gonna cover a little bit of the, um, why we want to use wood chips or where wood chips are applicable and why people would choose this. Um, so some of the reasons um, that um, makes people decide on various um, different fuels um, you know, there's, there's many different reasons why people um, choose a fuel that they end up with, but uh, sometimes it's locally available, sometimes it's a low cost situation, sometimes it's a space situation where you only have one wall and you can only hang a condensing wall mounted boiler on there. And so those, um, and all these criteria have to be taken into consideration here. And in case of the um, biomass, it's oftentimes decided on these uh, six points here where either there's a green mandate where a school board or county seat has decided that they wanna go all green and biomass is one of the ways to go green alongside with solar heat pumps and other very, you know, wind power and things like that. Um, Typically, another good reason on biomass, uh, for choosing biomass is of course the cost reduction that's primarily the reason why we get uh, put into projects because biomass in general has been a, a low cost solution for people, especially on the fuel side, not so much on the CapEx side where on the project development side. 
fuel fuel stabilization is quite clear that wood prices have not i mean they've slowly risen but it's a very slow rise you, you never see much more than a you know three or four percent rise over any given year and so that's quite um, that's quite stable compared to the fossil fuel side um, and uh, the carbon dioxide reduction goals um, for a few companies if they're internationally traded there might be taxation on this carbon emissions you see them that choice being uh, weighed by a lot of uh, sort of very large multinational companies that look at a larger tax issue where carbon dioxide is taxed in um, in various area, in various areas not so much in the us yet but if there is a company that has uh, european holdings um, and they have to uh, reduce their carbon footprint overall on all their holdings then they might have a choice like this um, then we also have quite a few people and that's regionally of course very important um, they want to just use a local fuel and that helps the local economy and that makes things uh, work on a local basis and uh, surprisingly in school boards especially um, we see that choice being one of the most important ones um, the low cost and the local sourcing of fuels is um, always rated very high and here are the different options here of uh, what kind of wood fuels are available wood pellets have been around now since the mid 90s and are very stable and very refined wood fuel um, they produce really good emission values they are very easy to transport and uh, quite a reliable um, you know they're all the same size and they have the same energy content um, so it's a quite refined wood fuel um, step up from there are the pdcs that's what we manufacture it's also quite refined in the way that we have the same particle size as well as the same energy content and that's controlled by the moisture content so by screening and by dehydration process um, the pdcs are you know the most refined wood chip um, but not quite as refined because the um, energy density is less than that of pellets. And then the green chips are the least refined uh, fuel on the wood chip side and it can vary in moisture content. It usually depends on what day you harvest the, the chips or how long you've stored them. And so and how much bark and what species. There's a tremendous amount of variety and so unless you're a very skilled purchaser you don't really know what you're getting with green chips it could be coming from a pine forest one day or it could be coming from a hardwood forest the next day and your boiler has to uh, be running on the same tuned uh, settings that somebody has uh, installed you know set the boiler either on a day where it was 50 percent moisture content and the settings work for that environment but the next day or next week you might have uh, 35 percent moisture content with a different type of wood in there so it's a little bit less um, managed uh, from the boiler side efficiency side and from the material handling side there as well um, and of course that uh, th these choices up front are very important to develop the project um, there's um, additional reasons uh, why one can make in some cases only a pellet choice because sometimes the energy density is so important that you just don't have the room for a tremendous amount of storage on uh, on energy and so if you have an interior bin and you need at a minimum two weeks worth of storage you might not be able to use pdcs or green chips because interior bins are hard for green chips because they have a tremendous amount of water and so that would then either cause a little bit of mold or it would cause um, you know a lot of condensation on the walls on the interior and you might not have enough storage um, capacity to last for two weeks in addition um, you know on the pdc sites you just might not have enough energy to last for the two weeks um, and so the default uh, solution in that case could be the pellets. 
Um, the downfall of the pellets, of course, is it's the most refined and therefore the most expensive. It's more than double the, or it's, it's about double the cost of the PDCs and then the PDCs are more or less the double of the cost of the green chips. So um, here are a little bit of the numbers associated with um, these various fuels. You can see one ton of um, green chips here yields uh, or is equivalent to 66 gallons of oil, whereas one ton of pellets is equivalent to 120 tons of oil. Hey, Mark, this is Mike Davy. I have a question for you. One of the things we, we hear talked about are the different types of wood that are available. You, you touched on it. The, the majority, you know, we've, we hear about hardwood and softwood and different BTU contents. The majority of the chips that are used in heating, um, what what species are those hardwood or softwoods and, and what goes into why you purchase um, one versus the other? Yeah, so there's quite a bit of, um, per ton, the BTU content is quite even. But the cubic yards per um, per ton are quite different. So you might get three cubic yards out of a hardwood uh, chip, and you might have four and a half yards if you're getting pine tree uh, chips. And then, so what that affects is, in fact, in some cases, in some instances, we uh, sold a boiler and it was designed for, you know, a mix of softwood and hardwood. And then the customer chose to, you know, in the first week to go to pine chips because it was cheaper. And so the moisture content was higher and the volume that the machine had to process to get the same amount of output through was much, much higher. So for every ton of um, fuel, they were moving, you know, 25% in more material through. So in, in, in that particular case, um, you know, augers and gearboxes had to be changed in order to do that. So it's also a matter of tuning. If you're tuning a boiler and the auger is moving um, the fuel for a certain output at this level, then when you put in a different fuel, it has to either move more or less fuel out and you know the tuning is out of out of tune and so these kind of decisions have to be uh, made early on and it's an advantage when you have these pdcs they're basically mixed in the same energy content per volume at all times so you have a pretty refined fuel just like in fuel oil you're always getting 138,000 btu per gallon it's very steady where and the same in propane it's a little bit less of course per gallon but you're getting that 92 92,000 um btu per gallon and pdcs you're going to get you know right under 10,000 btus per um ton um is that true uh, 10 million sorry um off by a certain factor there but um and then in the green chips uh, per ton, you're going to get quite the same, but again, um, depending on moisture content, uh, it has quite a bit of an effect on, on your boilers. So um, it's certainly overcome quite easily, but uh, when you go out there and you source green, green chips, it's a lot, lot less controlled because the loggers are going in the woods, they get the green chips, and they drive, drive them directly to the customer. There's hardly a screening plant in between. Uh, it's in few cases that it is managed to an even energy content per um, per unit volume. So that's where these advantages of the more refined fuels um, really give you a, a longevity in the boiler life and also an efficiency of the apparatus is um, quite a bit increased. And here you see the costs um, associated with everything. So pellets right now, 18 bucks. PDC is more than $11.5. And, um, and then the green chips at 10 bucks. And 
And those are the thermal wrecks associated with that, which you get back from from the PUC at this point, and you you're able to gain some monetary um, value back from using this wood. So it's a subsidy that is um, supported by the NHPC here. This is uh, this is Mike again. I just I think that screen was interesting because although although you you think that um, based on the cost it would be obvious which to go with, um, you know you, you'd always pick the lowest per ton. What 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 our company EEI does is we audit the buildings and then run the capital cost of the construction against each of these options. And what we've found is that for, for smaller buildings, oftentimes pellets, because of the um, store, the site, site storage availability, uh, getting that higher BTU per ton might be worth, um, the, if there's very limited storage, pellets still have their place where they make a lot of sense. Um, and, then all the, and then green chips, although they're the, the cheapest, generally, the, it's the most expensive to retrofit these in. So when we when we run the number at EEI, we're we're neutral on technology, um, and we find that kind of the much larger buildings uh, or campuses is where we see green chips oftentimes making a lot of sense. But on buildings like high schools, middle schools. Um, PDCs has won out nine times out of 10 because it has a, a much lower infrastructure cost compared to uh, the green chips for storage. So, you know, the, the pricing tells one story, but uh, every, every building is different. And we're doing a building right now where we're looking at pellets and we think pellets make the most sense. And then other ones where we're looking at uh, PDC or green chips. So it really does depend uh, site by site. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to um, have a, this, you know, it's very hard to apply a rule of thumb on where to use what. It's really a very individual assessment of each site um, that you have to make with an experienced developer to assess it and get the right value out of it. Um, it sometimes even involves also what's the available staff because uh, with very refined fuels that even applies to fossil fuels the more it is refined the less maintenance you have so uh, if you feel like you have a staff that's quite robust and experienced and wants to take on more maintenance to create more savings then the green chips you know obviously have the, the lowest value uh, per energy unit um, but in some cases you might not actually have access to a service personnel. And so that might be a choice where you go with a pellet or in, in, in some cases, even just fossil fuel, because you might not have that. There's a little bit of increased uh, service work that you have to do when you have a wood boiler. So uh, I just wanted to get into the project here itself. This is a project in Brattleboro, Vermont, Green Street. It's quite an old building. And it's been remodeled and uh, redone uh, on three different in three different uh, three different times, and the energy upgrades uh, throughout this were quite modest. Um, from year one, it always had the same um, steam boiler system in there, and it was never taken out. We we actually just removed it with our installation here a couple of years ago. And um, there, there's the old boiler, and um, and then there was uh, because the old boiler started to not be very reliable. Uh, they actually on the left side you can see there is a little bit more modern from the 60s. Um, so uh, both boilers are quite old, and they had to be removed. They were both steam boilers, and at this point, um, the ownership or the, the school boards really wanted to go to hot water. They felt like it was too much work to maintain a steam system and to get qualified people to um, maintain the, the overall uh, mechanical plant there or heating plant. Um, but here in this school, there's very, very limited um, space here. In fact, this, when we were first awarded this project, it was actually a pellet project 
and then, then in the last second, the uh, school uh, decided that they wanted, in fact, um, turn it into a chip system. Um, we had given them an option that they could do an interior chip storage bin. And for a little bit of extra money, um, they ended up choosing that option even after we had won it as a pellet project. Um, and uh, it was really just based on payback. Um, and they found some extra money to pay that extra increase there. So here uh, we found a perfect storm, which is not so common. Um, it's maybe only one out of every 10 projects where you find the perfect storm. But of course, you had end of life here with two pieces of equipment. So they had to do something regardless. And they wanted to um, design something with not just redundant in two boilers, but also redundant in fuel sources. So they were quite happy to have one fuel source as wood. And then the other fuel source was actually done then with propane. Um, the oil tank was removed altogether, which we find quite often now that the oil and underground uh, oil storage is becoming much more problematic and harder to ensure. And it's getting quite costly to do that kind of work. And then the other um, big um, part of what they wanted to achieve here is they wanted to complete the mitigation work. Uh, there was quite a bit of asbestos throughout the school because the steam pipes had um, quite a bit of asbestos along them, especially in the basement area, which was just a crawl space. Um, and uh, certainly right around the boilers, none of that had been mitigated yet because they could not remove the boilers or do the mitigation without removing the boilers. So um, part of the project was kind of to address uh, the complete completion of the mitigation for the entire school so there's no more asbestos in there as far as they know for sure and then increase the ventilation system which is typically a little bit of an increase in energy use and then of course uh, and then to um, increase also the control um, functions of their of their plant they did have a control system in there but it was very rudimentary and in the end of the day it was more or less controlled by the individual teachers in that school with a wall thermostat. And so now they have a central control system, um, building automation system that controls the boiler plant, as well as the individual rooms and as well as the ventilation uh, with, you know, with CO, CO meters and, and uh, or, yes, and uh, a full control for everything, including believe even the lighting. So um, so we, we of course, just focused on some of these I, things that the school took on other contractors and self-performed that as a general contractor and um, went above and below. We, we just took on the controls, the HVAC and the boiler plant and the new distribution system. So full on gut of the steam pipes on all three floors and new hot water pipes. So a little bit, um, the savings were very good for us right off the bat. Um, these are really tremendous savings. And um, I do not have the electrical savings, but there was quite a bit of electrical savings as well generated because we um, reduced the overall mechanical system um, by quite a bit. Now here you have the new plant with uh, 150 kilowatt rolling boiler on the left hand side called the T4 and then the Wiesman boiler on the right hand side. Um, they're quite color coordinated. On the, on the two pictures on the left you actually see the local maintenance um, man is taking out the ash right there and he has to do that once a week. Um, so that ash bin is about 12 gallons and that is something that you cannot skip. Uh, I mean, if you have very light heating loads, yes, you can bump that up to two weeks, but that is one of the things that you have to do on a weekly basis and that's in all schools. Uh, it's one of the um, increased uh, maintenance aspects that you have to expect with burning biomass. So it's biomass, you know, it's a solid fuel and it's a certain amount of ash. It's typically about uh, one to one and a half percent by weight. And so if you have a school, in this case, they're burning about 80 ton 
So they'll have, um, you know, 0.8 ton, a little, little bit, call it one ton of ash uh, per year. Um, and that is about, you know, 1.5 metric or 1.5 yards of ash. So, um, you know, once a week you take one of these out and by that time the ash does re reduce in size quite a bit. It's very fluffy. But um, when you put it in a larger container or pile, it does shrink down. So those are the the must the must dos of the uh, maintenance maintenance of the biomass upkeep. Here you see the access door, the maintenance door to the interior storage. In this case, the school had no room at all. That's why they chose pellets. In fact, and um, in the beginning, and um, there was just going to be a pellet silo interior, and then they, you know, they ended up going with a um, more robust chip storage bin, and the, and the um, chips are blown in with a blower truck that I will have a picture of here as well, and then we put in radiators, wall-hung radiators, um, in all the original places. We, um, in general. You know, we took out, I think, uh, over 100 radiators and we only had to put in about 50 radiators, a little bit larger ones, but um, overall, all the energy upgrades that were done, being done simultaneously uh, reduced the footprint a little bit as well, the energy footprint. Here you can see the schematic of how that works. You have the biomass boiler on your left and that is always run in conjunction with a buffer tank and that injects into the primary loop, which is then the distribution loop for the school as well as for the uh, domestic hot water. So um, right now this boiler runs all year. Um, it doesn't consume hardly anything. I, um, you know, they the domestic hot water is turned off sometimes in the summer. So doesn't have to do a lot of upkeep in the summer, but um, the system does work all year uh, because there's teachers in the school in the summer. Now we're on to John Stark Regional High School. It's a project that we did with EEI and Mike. Yeah, so again, I'm um, Mike Davey with EEI. So we were selected, um, the school district did a, uh, wanted to do an energy performance contract. They did um, an RFQ um, and interviewed two companies and and ended up selecting um, EEI. And the goal was they have um, four schools in the district. The largest is John Stark High School. Um, and their goal was to do, they, they, need, they had a 1980 boiler system um, and they were spending about $50,000 a year in maintenance of the heating plant. Um, they also had a very antiquated digital control system um, that wasn't, wasn't allowing um, user in, good user interface, uh, mostly fluorescent lighting. Um, and I will say politically, um, Politically, where if there's any where residents, you'll they'll know it's a tough. It's a conservative town. It's it's hard to get uh, projects passed. You really have to to fight for them. Um, and one of the challenges that that John Stark told us is the project had to be completely budget neutral. So they had to go to the to the voters of where with a project uh, in which the energy savings would completely pay for any improvements over uh, the finance period. In this project, I believe the finance period was 15 years. So when one, the way EEI uh, goes to market is, is we're neutral on any technology. So for this building, we looked at um, option one, just staying on oil and putting in more efficient oil burners. Um, we looked at a conversion to high efficiency condensing propane. Um, and we looked at, then we looked at with Mark's company, either going to a dry chip or a pellet system. Um, at, at, first, at first, there was some nervousness from the customer about going to, to wood chip just because of the maintenance. 
and um, propane may have been the easier sell. Um, but w when we when we brought the staff up to Plymouth High School and looked at a system that was done the previous year, they were really wowed by um, how relatively easy it is to run and uh, with the overall energy savings. So Plymouth High School had been done two years prior and they were receiving about um, 290,000 in energy savings a year versus their previous oil and electric system. So once they heard those type of numbers, um, we got the the attention of the energy committee and the um, and the budget committee, and they let us really really dive deep. We were able to put in an LED lighting system, put this heating system in, um, put in a control system, um, and have it be budget neutral. There were a few things that that really helped push us across the finish line. One is uh, we did receive a grant from the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission. And we, um, uh, there is a rec program which which incentivizes uh, users to um, to use wood heat instead of fossil fuel. Uh, the thermal rec program, which I think is unique to New Hampshire. So once all those things were in the equation, it became pretty obvious that even the most conservative voters in town uh, would support wood. And so we we this project actually got overwhelming support in Henniker and um, and where um, for for the wood chip system. Uh, it was installed in one summer, um, but those two oil went out. We actually put in a condensing propane backup system so that you can switch from one fuel to the other. Um, and I guess that a sketch of that there. Yep. So that's again, you, you we have the large buffer tank and I think one of the things that I was interested in was the idea of this buffer tank. Essentially, propane. The propane boiler is great at ramping up and down. Um, that I think. Oh, it's it's actually a lock and bar. So that lock and bar boiler, which is propane, I believe it has a, a it's a two million or three million BTU, and it can run. Um, it has a ten to one turn down, so it has no problem running at ten percent of its output. The biomass boilers are a little bit. Um, have much less turn down. They, they can't go down to that fractional percentage of their output. They really want to run when they run. Um, so that buffer tank allows the boiler to be heating something up pretty much all the time. Even if there's not an instantaneous demand out in the building, the fact that you have that buffer tank uh, to take some of the load and you're not shocking this boiler by constantly asking for a ton of, um, a ton of, heat um first thing first thing in the morning you pull off that buffer tank first uh there's a couple other things you know being neutral in technology we do a lot of projects that have vrf we do a lot that have uh propane there's a couple of things that that were interesting about biomass design in general is um because the fuel source is so cheap like we mentioned you know hundreds of thousands of savings in in plymouth high school um, doing the deep, deep, deep setbacks is not as important. Um, so, for example, Plymouth High School before before we would um, the facility director you would try and set back to fifty five degrees, um, and that's because oil was you know over three dollars a gallon. Um, what we found with the biomass systems, um, you, you're really much better off to, to just do a much more mild setback, and your fuel costs are still just fraction of um, of what you were using when you were on oil or propane. And so again, dry chips made this project go where if it was pellets, uh, the energy cost probably would have been too high. And if it was green chips, the infrastructure cost would have been too high compared to the oil usage. So the sweet spot for this facility when we looked at all the different options was the dry chip. Yeah, and no, I, yeah. I would like to add uh, something a little bit to that. And that is on the uh, the turndown uh, and the buffer tank. So the turndown ratio of biomass boiler in general, even if people are advertising it as ten to one, is really just three to one is a good turndown ratio to use. So if you go down to thirty percent or thirty five percent or so, that's a nice adequate. After that, if you need to turn it much further down, um, um, you know it can go turn on and off, of course, automatically. Um, but generally, 
the the wallet just cannot run very efficient at that at that low um, turn down. So it's better to, for it to turn off, use the buffer frame tank for a little while, and then it comes out of maintenance mode and turns back on when it needs to. Um, the buffer tank itself also, um, because we oftentimes undersize the biomass boilers from the peak load, the buffer tank, um, of course, um, allows it to smooth out all the curves, as Mike says, and um, allows it when it, um, either in the morning when there's a very large load coming out of setback, has a little extra energy stored in it, but also when when you're turning off the boiler, when the loads are met in the system, in the distribution system, the buffer tank, you know, the boiler might not be able to shut down quick enough and would overheat, but the buffer tank actually absorbs that energy during the shutdown periods as well. So it's quite an important uh, piece of equipment. It doesn't seem very, um, it's not very high technology, it's literally just a tank. But there's a little bit more to it by the time you assemble all these things and so it's an integral part of the design to use it and uh, most manufacturers really actually insist on it um, for it to operate correctly. So you can see here some um, estimated cost savings that this is only run a couple of years so it's it's very little um, proven yet because we've had a couple of warm years we don't know exactly um, what's up yet and also we don't know exactly what they had in the bin starting and stopping uh, in the year so as we get to five years we'll smooth out this curve and have a, a more exact um, savings from Mike but right now we have, um, some, some One of the things that we we're doing on this project, in addition to the to the energy to the biomass project, is we have what's called um, an analytics software that is installed on their control system, and it provides a monthly report to the facility director um, about how well the building's setting back, how how often the ventilation systems are running. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about a school district, from an energy standpoint, the most expensive thing is usually ventilation because you're bringing in a ton of outside air to heat up um, or be cooled down, uh, then to be exhausted out the building. So anytime you're bringing in that air um, when you don't need to, you're spending a lot of, of money. And so we have an analytics software that's that monitors every point in the HVAC system every um, every 15 minutes and then the, the facility director gets a report so he can find out if there's a gym unit that got turned on for one basketball game and then has been left on all month and can shut it off quickly. We show him the 10 worst points and that's really helped us to, to beat energy savings on these projects. Um, we, we had a guaranteed savings amount of, I think, 115,000 here, and we've been hitting uh, close to 150,000. So they're happy enough with the results that we are now doing uh, the other three schools this summer with, uh, with projects. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. These, this is just the, just the fuel cost savings that does not take into consideration the rec cost right now as well and i'm not even sure are you allowed to count that on the um, as part of your savings as well yeah okay. and you can see the biomass system and mike has already alluded to that uh, it is a very large increase on capex over or capital expenditure over a fossil fuel system because you have a silo and a silo concrete pad underneath it, you have material handling systems. So you have a lot more equipment. It is quite surprising how much that costs in the end of the day. And of course the labor to put it in and to automate it all. But um, just in case somebody is wondering, these systems are fully automated. Nobody's shoveling any coal or wood here. This is um, the pump, the blower truck fills the silo um, through a six inch tube and then drives away. And then after that, the silo provides heat there for about two or three weeks, depending on your heat load during the year or during the seasons. 
a little bit how that you can see the fill pipe very clearly there. Those are the we actually have a tractor trailer back up to that, and they bring about 24 ton of chips, and they can easily fill two two tractor trailers into that bin. And here we are. We're on pretty good time here for our last school, Mill River Union. This, this was another um, EEI project. It's it's made up, I think, of seven towns um, in western Vermont, and. Um, they, their regional high school is definitely one of the biggest buildings in town. Uh, they use, they had um, oil an oil steam system. Um, what was unique about this project is the facility director um, wanted to stay on steam. You can see that picture. There's the old 1960s steam H.P. Uh, Smith boilers. Um, they were comfortable with steam, so they were happy to to stay with steam. That limits the amount of manufacturers that make biomass heating. Um, uh, luckily, we we use Schmid. Um, they made a steam uh, wood chip system. We installed the dry chip silo here. Um, this project again had to be budget neutral, so they were the facility was only interested in. Um, um, projects that would be budget neutral. We did receive, I think, $100,000 in grants and rebates um, uh, through Efficiency Vermont that helped make this project possible. Um, it was again completed over one summer. Uh, we compared it to, we went back and forth with the school board a lot on looking at propane versus wood chip. Um, one of the, this part of the state, I think, is supportive of wood heat in general. Uh, and there was it's it's a wood area and a farming area, so silos are fairly common. Um, so again, this pro this project also passed with with a wide amount of support in town, uh, being completely budget neutral, and it included upgrades to all of the schools in the district. Some of them went to high efficiency propane, but the large buildings um, definitely made sense to use this steam dry chip system. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> typically the biggest amount of energy or the highest amount of energy in a, in a high school goes towards the heating system and of course the electrical system. Um, and sometimes they're of course related if you have major pumps, I remember over in Plymouth High School, that's the school you mentioned beforehand, uh, a tremendous amount of savings were actually achieved by just improving the pump uh, situation over at that school and um, using a more efficient pump um, sometimes can pay for itself in a single year. So, and, and one thing I would like to mention, just because a lot of times I spend, I spend a lot of time up at the dealing with school boards and then town meetings. And, and one of the things that we're hearing much more in Vermont and New Hampshire is a goal of being fossil fuel free. And um, we have many projects that at least want to know how much it would cost. And then um, there's a lot of times there's, there's one of the ways that that is considered is, is a heat pump or VRF. Now that technology in, in a residential setting and in a new construction commercial building makes a lot of sense. Uh, a lot of these schools though have undersized elect electric capacity and ventilation systems that would would cost millions of dollars to turn to go to VRF. So if it, what we talked about that at Mill River High School and and to go to a VRF system is probably a four to five million dollar project. Whereas the biomass system, I think, was was a million under a million, and it went to renewable heat. So one of the, one of the things I say is don't don't fall in love with a technology necessarily because every building might have a different host and a different uh, a different uh, cost benefit. And and here, dry chips really just made all the sense in the world to go to renewable. And I think this was only the second or third dry chip installation in Vermont. And we're hoping to continue uh, moving the market that way. Yeah, in general, the dry chips have been, uh, or Vermonters have been quite uh, receptive to this technology, but um, 
the incentives are not quite as good in Vermont as they are in New Hampshire. So New Hampshire has been underwriting that a little bit from the PUC level through these T-Rex and some various um, commercial grants and things that have become available from time to time. So there's some financial advantages to building these plants in New Hampshire, but Vermont politically is quite aligned with it. They do have a really good wood resource and they have a very good sort of forest management system in place that is throughout the entire states. And, um, you know, they're quite used to it. So there's a good long rich history of burning wood in Vermont. And they, uh, they were actually one of the, you know, early innovators, uh, the trendsetters in a, in a program called Fuels for Schools. Vermont was really the leading state in that program. And that is now, um, that has come to an end quite some time ago, but those boilers are now going out of um, operation. And so there's a nice opportunity for people that have been burning wood for quite some time to reintroduce them to a little bit more upscale technology that is a little bit more efficient and um, could, you know, sort, uh, get them going for another 20 years there. Mark, do you, do you think some of those old, because um, because I've done a lot of audits in Vermont high schools, and a lot of them have like you know thirty plus year old um, green chip boilers or mesh Smith or chip tech or whatever. Um, are those candidates to be replaced with a dry chip? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. For for one thing, people are used to the technology, so they're not scared of it. That's a usually a very large hurdle for us to overcome. People just don't know of wood chips as a fuel and they like the fossil fuel because they know that it's reliable and whatnot. So there's a, usually a, a pretty large hurdle to overcome. So if, if you have a client that has been heating quietly for the last 30, 40 years with this technology, you already have, you know, built in trust in that system. So that is very nice. Uh, but the capital of replacing them is, very high, so it's up to a company like yours that provides sort of uh, a format to make that fairly budget neutral uh, for them to afford a replacement. So, but as you know, it's a very that's a very difficult thing to do to place a boiler or a heating plant like that and make that budget neutral because mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I have a half a million or a million or a million and a half dollars depending on what size school or project that is and to that that's a tremendous amount of savings uh, that you have to um, get to build a project that's neutral for them Be, because i have this audience and if, if anyone are involved with local uh, municipalities um, or energy efficiency companies the worst thing a school can do that hasn't done these types of upgrades is do led lighting projects the reason the reason why is the savings so in mill river the savings from the lighting conversion which which was probably a four or five year payback really helps pay for these larger infrastructure projects in a municipal setting so a lot of times we get calls like this uh eei hey we took care of the lighting ourselves but now we're ready for you guys to come do the controls and ventilation and and you know biomass or projects and it's like uh it makes it way harder when the lighting has been done first because th the way our projects work are the overall savings and then financing that savings over a long period of time to create something budget neutral or close to budget neutral it gets really hard if the building already has state-of-the-art lighting so um i always say if you're at one of the one of the uh if you're at a public meeting and people are saying, hey, we're doing a lighting retrofit at the elementary school, at least ask them if they've done a heating analysis first. <laughs> right. No, I agree with that. It's, uh, it's, it's always more difficult uh, when some of the things are done. And sometimes we see that somebody, you know, has a 50-year-old boiler and puts brand new pumps in and yes, they're saving this little bit of electricity uh, for the coming year and things like that, but really they haven't addressed the the core issue with the entire heating system. It's actually not that one pump, but uh, the heating plant. And so um, sometimes when they put a little bit of good money after, you know, it, it doesn't really achieve the overall goals of the, for the school district, unfortunately. So, so we we prefer. I mean, the perfect storm process is a, is a school 
that really hasn't addressed mechanical systems or the control system. We work with controls companies and things like that. So it's always nice uh, when there's a few things, then you can guarantee a project that has a good payback and has a really good improvement for the entire school. Um, because you can start as it's sort of a clean slate. Absolutely. Good. I think that is pretty good. And we're on time here, just a few minutes early. Jim, do you have anything that you wanted to add to things? I, I would simply say that if you have questions, uh, you can either open your microphone and ask directly, or you can type it in to the chat box. There's the uh, little balloon. One of your icons at the bottom of the screen is a little uh, cartoon balloon there. And uh, you can type, click on that, and you will end up getting a, uh, a little place that you can enter questions. If we don't have any questions, um, there's, you know, you could also, Mike has some things, just if you're not aware of the benefits of performance contracting, uh, you could, uh, we could have him tell a little bit more about that. So if somebody in particular would like to hear that, you could raise your hand, which is another thing you can do on here, which is, uh, let's see here. I don't know exactly how you do that, but it seems like there's some sort of a thing where you can uh, raise your hand. So anyhow, um, if we have any questions, I don't see anything coming in. I think we could probably... Mike, just tell us a couple of things about how you get involved with uh, performance contracting. You know, how does that usually occur? That's a good question. Um, it, it goes a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes um, we'll have a school or a university or reach out to our, us directly because they've been referred by another company. We'll meet with the facilities team and set up an audit plan. Uh, sometimes school districts come up with this idea um, or they find out about it and the markets that we focus in a lot are New Hampshire and Vermont and Northern Massachusetts. And a lot of those areas are not have a ton of state funding coming in for capital projects. And so having a project that's financed from the energy savings can be very, um, can be very attractive. Um, so a lot of times our company will answer RFQs after someone puts it out. Uh, that was sort of how Mill River came to be. The facility director, um, Gary Marcy, was familiar with performance contracting uh, from doing a project at a, at a previous job. He, he uh, issued an RFQ. Then um, they selected us to do the audit. What I always say about a performance contract and in public say, um, spaces is there's basically there's basically two to three sales efforts if you will to bring a project forward there, there's the first which is the response to an rfq or, or rfp or or um however that goes then there is um doing an audit trying to find a project that makes sense for all the parties involved uh, and when I say the parties involved, there's a facility director, typically there's a, a school board, there's a budget committee, and sometimes there's a, a, um, a uh, energy committee, and all of them may have slightly different desires from the project. So you have to bring, you have to find a compromise best project, and then uh, you go forward to the public so that uh, to get their, um, to get their yes or no vote typically so there's three separate efforts to try and find the right project mix um i, I think biomass is always something we should look at for these projects um it's not a solution everywhere but um but in many cases i think it's a great technology and we've enjoyed partnering with Froling on almost all of our biomass projects um, because they provide a near turnkey solution for, for these types of projects um and the, the key is again having the energy savings and the uh, the investment grade audit to help the customers realize that the energy savings can help pay for these projects over time okay very good um, somebody asked for a copy of the presentation and that would be perhaps the the, the powerpoint screens and we can send that out uh, we also uh, will have a recording that should be available at some point in the future. 
uh, usually fairly soon. Usually this is our second one, so I'll say it, it came out pretty fast last time. So otherwise, uh, if you have any questions, uh, again, you can open up your mic uh, or you can uh, can type it in. And I think uh, thank you to to Mike and Mark for for doing this this afternoon. Next week, we again have one on air emissions, which should be on the technical side as far as trying to, if you're involved in uh, in siting or, you know, want to understand maybe what you have to go through to put up a, especially a larger boiler system, uh, this would be uh, a good, a really good uh, webcast to go to. And then the following one we're all very concerned about, and that is the biomass sustainability. Is biomass sustainable? You hear about people saying, oh, wood, that's just the new coal. That, that's nothing special. Well, we beg to differ. We live in New Hampshire. We live in Vermont. We're not trying to heat Boston. We think we've got a, a real sensible use of wood here. And that's what we, you know, that, that's what we're trying to do is especially the rural areas of, of our states. And it stretches all the way from Maine all the way to, to northern New York. Uh, it's a wonderful region where uh, biomass makes tremendous sense. And we're going to be talking about that. And that's on the 30th of June. And then we'll be repeating one that's just about uh, the dry chips and a comparison of the three different fuels, a little more technical, some of those slides that Mark showed and more uh, just to talk about that. That'll be repeated for July 7th. So uh, please attend those if you can. And again, I thank you. I don't see any more questions. So uh, wait a second, maybe there's one. Uh, no, there's not. So we're good. Thank you, everybody. We're going to say goodbye. Mike, Mark, good night.